So while they're um, getting prepared and getting their headsets on, I'll do a quick introduction of, uh, of the team and the project from Saskatoon. So uh, our discussion today is on community paramedicine in Saskatoon Health Region uh, within the city of Saskatoon. And uh, Saskatoon Health Region, MD Ambulance, and community stakeholders have engaged in a number of community paramedicine initiatives. Um, and so this program will go through those community paramedicine initiatives that are uh, within the city and are flourishing. So our panel, uh, Andrew Williamson, uh, he is the Deputy Chief of Operations for MD Ambulance. Anita Bergen is Manager of Seniors Health and Continuing Care for Saskatoon Health Region. And Pat uh, Stevenson is Executive Director of Stonebridge Crossing Retirement Community. It's a personal care home. And Farron Nakaska is an advanced care paramedic with uh, the Saskatoon Pilot Community Paramedicine Program, and he's from MD Ambulance. So we'll let Andrew get started. Good morning. My, uh, oh, look at that, we've already gone two slides into the presentation, that's excellent. Uh, my goal today is to, to give everybody kind of an overview of what I consider to be our portfolio of community paramedicine. Um, at MD Ambulance, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, more than a couple uh, different avenues of where we've taken our, our paramedicine uh, pilot, and um, I'm quite happy to share that with you today. So uh, the slide prior to this just showed a, a partnership slide, and uh, what I found and what we found, I think, uh, most important is that EMS by nature were very quick. Uh, obviously, we're very quick to respond, we're very quick to, to turn on a dime and, and uh, answer any questions or, or move on any new initiatives. I think what we had to learn as an industry, or, or certainly as a local, is, uh, is, is to learn to slow down, to learn to be collaborative, discuss, have good discussions with our stakeholders. Um, someone told me at one point, did, did you either lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. And I think that uh, we found that we can lead but we have to make sure we do it in a way that's respectful and in collaboration with others. So that, that was a big learning lesson for, for us, specifically at, at our company. Uh, we did that by having discussions with, with our regulation bodies, with our nursing unions, with public health, indeed with our doctors, directors of care, and, uh, and with our patients as well. So the health bus as, as one one of our uh, pieces of our portfolio I, has been discussed at the International Roundtable in the past, and, and some of you may, may be familiar with the model or had an opportunity to see it as it was parked out front with the, uh, the Chiefs Conference on Wednesday and Thursday. But it's quite a dynamic piece of our, uh, of our model. Uh, for one thing, in, in Saskatoon, we have temperatures that range from plus 40 to minus 40, and that's Celsius. And for anybody who needs that in Fahrenheit, that's minus 40 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, a, a bus full of water and people running at minus 40 certainly creates some, some challenges. I mean, the, the water lines tend to freeze at minus 30, and, uh, and the generator is required to run the entire uh, nine and a half hour shift that it's on site to provide air conditioning in the summertime. So we, we do have some, uh, some challenges to that. The good news is at minus 30, we don't have many wait lines. The, the, the ED weights at the, at the bus is, is pretty much uh, uh, non-existent. Someone told me once that, uh, that form will follow function. So the, the function of the health bus was to provide high quality, low acuity primary health care in the community of Saskatoon. Saskatoon uh, stakeholders identified the aim as to create health equity and close the disparity gap for those who are geographically, socially, and economically or culturally uh, isolated. So we do that. Uh, by, by having the form, which, which uh, promotes health promotion and education. Uh, we do assessments and wound care, immunizations, prescriptions and referrals, and follow-up care, as well as chronic disease management. One of the uh, interesting things we found about staffing the health bus with primary care paramedics is that the paramedic by nature really wants to be a doer. And, uh, and on the health bus specifically, they're, they're much, much more... Uh, of a, of a team member, and we had to find a way to, to, to find something that would engage them or, or give them a, a hook into the, uh, into the program. So in work with public health and with the region, we took on uh, flu vaccine as, as a part of the, uh, the health bus and made that primary care paramedic 
the lead provider of the, uh, of the flu vaccine on that bus, and it really gave them a, an insight or a, an ownership to the bus, and we've really seen a, a good uh, uptake with the paramedics uh, doing that. The health bus parks in, in part of our, uh, our population, which is, which is um, socioeconomically quite challenged. If we were to overlay a map of this with our, uh, with our socioeconomic map, you, you would see that it is, is quite identical. Um, these are the areas of uh, clients by neighborhood within our, within our uh, region. And the health bus parks at a different place each day of the week within this region, although the same place each day of the week, if that makes sense. So every Monday it's at this corner, every Tuesday it's at this corner, every Wednesday it's at this corner, and it, and it repeats itself. So they, they become very predictable of where they're at, and the clientele gets, gets to uh, rely on, on seeing the bus there every day. What we'd see for the bus is, uh, is, is, is going forward is that we, we look to enhance the safety um, but yet maintaining the non-judgmental and approachable venue that's there. Because it does park in, in some uh, neighborhoods that are a little bit on the, on the rougher side, sometimes we, we have to keep that in mind. And, and uh, because we're in a bus that only has one point of exit and one point of entry, that creates a dynamic. So we've, we've done some things with our hospital security staff that'll drop by and do just random drop-ins and checks. And um, the staff do have windows all over so they can see the people approaching and, and keeping that in mind. But we haven't gone to the uh, model of putting the uniforms back on. So our, our health bus staff are, are much like many of you today in a golf shirt and, and slacks. And, and we, we try not to have a, a non-approachable manner by throwing on the uniform. Um, obviously we, we look to enhance, uh, develop an enhanced model for our maintenance days. So when that generator breaks or those water lines freeze, we have to have downtime. And we look to uh, keep our eyes open for a rural equivalent to this health bus because at this time we only have one and it only functions within the city. Police detention is another model within our portfolio. And uh, our paramedic program uh, pilot initiated in July of 2011. We, we're still there today. It's shown great success. Um, we, we were there originally only on night shifts between 1800 and 06 o'clock in the morning. Um, but everybody who comes in, we believe them to be a detainee, not a patient. Okay, So every assessment that is done is done in city police as a, a baseline assessment. Where are they right now? Um, part of the biggest model or the challenges to the model is, is uh, the, the uniform is worn in police and while we're a black uniform and city police is a, is a dark navy uniform is identifying with the person that comes in that the questions that are being asked by the paramedic are, a, are for a non-policing matter. So while the booking sergeant certainly asks some risk stratification questions at the desk, you know, have you taken anything tonight, are you on any drugs, those questions will be repeated by the paramedic but there there's really needs to be that that uh, identification that we're asking these for, for a non-policing matter, we're here for your well-being should something happen. And then depending on the answers that they get, the, uh, the paramedic will determine whether simply sticking with a, a visual and verbal assessment is, uh, is appropriate or whether they should go on into a, a hands-on assessment which would include vital signs and perhaps a, a blood glucose testing included. So um, in 2015, you just see the numbers there of, of who, we, who we assessed and who we saw and the YO is identified as the young offenders who are also in the department. Just as a quick comparison on, on nights, uh, the, I'm colorblind, so I'm gonna throw that out there as my disclaimer. So the, the bar to the left of, that of each of those graphs are the transports that we did on night shifts prior to the pilot, and the bar on the right-hand side of each of those graphs is the number of transports we did out of city police cells uh, after the pilot has come on. In comparison, again, we were only there on nights, not days, so you see the transports from the department on days have stayed consistent where the transports on nights have dropped off significantly. So just recently we've been, we've been uh, told and, and given the funding to go forward and, and implement city police on a 24-7 on a model. We're quite excited about that. City police is very relieved that, that we'll be there for that model and, and offer that support to their staff. Um, we've recently just orientated 11 more staff to that site to allow that model to occur and, and literally you saw the sergeants uh, shoulders relax with, with that news being shared that as of July 1, we'll, we'll go 24-7. Again, if, uh, if police are assessing somebody out in the field and they're, they're concerned, we, we, we tell them, bring them in and, and let the paramedic have a look at them in, in detention. And at that point, they can be determined whether they would stay or go. The Lighthouse is another one of our models. This is a 120-bed facility, um, non-for-profit housing that, that offers an emergency shelter, supportive living, as well as affordable housing. 
Uh, many of the people in the lighthouse have uh, physical and cognitive disabilities, and, and many are overcoming disabilities, or uh, addictions, rather. Um, with, our, with our program, we, we saw that, uh, of course, many of us were experiencing offload delays in the emergency department, upwards of 160 hours per week when we did the, uh, the study. Um, EMS was making, on, on average, around 35 calls a month to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the facility. Um, interestingly, however, after the implementation of having the community paramedic uh, holding an office in the department or in the, in the building from 1,100 hours until 2,300 hours, and in the month of December when I indicated we can certainly have 40 below nights, we saw the number drop to below 20 visits in a month and in fact only five transports. So this, this, these were significant numbers for the, uh, for the lighthouse. So then on to our, what, we, what we refer to formally as our community paramedic, and, and again, we, we thank the, the health region for the partnership that we have there. Um, we proposed the, the community paramedic program to be something that would further decrease our emergency visits. Uh, it was part of a 14-day challenge that was announced by the, uh, the CEO of the health region. Um, we looked specifically in the, in the uh, pre-work at our long-term care transports, around 1,240 in a year, with a greater than 50% admission rate and an average length of stay of 13 days. Significant costs, significant contributor to the offloads uh, and the, uh, the non-vacancy in our ERs. So in April of 2015, we launched starting with two long-term term care sites. The, uh, the paramedics engaged in a five-week orientation period. Um, focusing a lot on uh, gerontology and the geriatric assessment. Uh, we were operating seven days a week and we've uh, seen 745 visits in that, in that time. Over that time, we've achieved an ER avoidance of our visits of, of over 85%, which is significant. Uh, 633 less eMERGE visits as a result. And we talk specifically about ER avoidance in this slide as opposed to cost savings in that uh, we know an ER visit is, is in the neighborhood of $300 a, a visit, and, and uh, I'm speaking specifically to those who don't visit eMERGE and not to those who uh, ultimately may be admitted for a significantly higher cost. And I think, Sherry, in your presentation yesterday, you spoke to a, a, a number in the, in the millions, which, uh, which would be the extrapolation of, of this figure. And those are our five community paramedics, one who, of which I'm, I'm honored to share the stage with today, Farron. Um, these paramedics were, were given the opportunity to self-select. Uh, we, we held an information session and, and the, the paramedics in our, in our company uh, came in and, and heard what the, the pilot was going to be about and, and determined for themselves whether this was something that they wanted to play a part in. Um, and we, we've had a great success, great buy-in with these five staff. Um, it, it's a very easy portfolio to manage because these guys want to see it succeed and they, and they take it forward on, the, on their own. To you. Thank you, Andrew. So Anita will take over and she will talk about specifically the community paramedicine pilot for the long-term care areas. She is our go-to guru for the Saskatoon Health Region in the Seniors Health and Continuing Care area. So every time we have a question about long-term care and their policies and procedures, she's our person. So thank you for joining us. Anita, while you guys are fixing that, I have to tell you a story. I was at SEMSA one time, and those of you that were at SEMSA, um, there was a couple nurses on a panel like this, and neither are a nurse and a doctor, and I happen to be the nurse, and it was the paramedics that had to fix our mics, so this is kind of embarrassing as the paramedic is fixing the nurse's mic right now. It's all good. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to do this, if that's okay, and then we'll all be good. So as Andrew was saying, the 14-day challenge uh, ended in the community paramedicine pilot being um, in long-term care. So our group was tasked with getting the pilot actually up and running. So what did that take? Well, of course, it took a lot of pre-meetings to get all, everybody on the same page, to know what we were actually doing and where we were going to go. And we identified really early on that we really needed to engage the nurses' union because we knew that along the way that nurses and long-term care would be the ones most affected by this change in process. And we wanted to make sure that we had the union on board so that we could, you know, guarantee success. 
and the time invested with the union was not insubstantial, but I think it was time really well spent. So our first task, of course, was to choose the homes. So how did we do that? Well, first of all, we, we had four criteria that we used. And the first criteria was, well, was the home ready and willing to participate in the pilot? We wanted the home to be excited about what, what possibilities were with this um, pilot. And we wanted the homes to anticipate success. So that was our first criteria. The second then was leadership capacity in the home. We know that leaders in long-term care homes are, have lots of conflicting priorities and they're very, very busy people. And we knew that this pilot would take some time, some time to physically be at meetings, but also to schedule and to make sure that, it, and then you know, all the rollout plans, that kind of thing, we needed the leaders to be on board as well. So that was another criteria. The third criteria was that of geographic location. And the city of Saskatoon is not a particularly large city, but we did want the homes geographically located in different locations so that we could start factoring in travel time for the community paramedics as part of the pilot. And the final criteria was simple volume of transfers of residents to the emergency room in the past year. And our department had been tracking it for 12 months, so we knew exactly which homes had utilized those services more. And so we kind of put all those criteria together and we determined that our first two pilot sites would be Luther Care Communities and Porteous Lodge, representing approximately 230 residents. Our second task then was to determine a process. What are we going to do to get those paramedics actually in the buildings? So we used a lean tool called value stream mapping. And what we did is we got leaders from the homes, nurses, we had our entire group get together and join in the task and we had big pieces of paper all over the wall, and we identified the experience of a resident from the first time the resident is identified as being ill, and all the steps in between to the point where the resident is actually transported, or the paramedics are called and transported the resident to the hospital. And then what we did was we identified gaps. What were the things that were missing in this process, and how could a community paramedic pilot identify those gaps, hopefully so the result would be that the resident was able to be treated right in the home and transport would be avoided. So through that process, we developed a process and of what potentially could work. So then we needed to develop the tools so that everyone would know exactly what was going on and we'd all be on the same page to ensure good communication by all team members. So this was another fun, fun time of developing pamphlets, letters to families, letters to physicians, work standards, as well as posters for staff, residents, and families. So on April 13th, 2015, we were ready to go. So on that very, very first day, uh, Angela was on and she went to both of the homes and she went to their nurse's report, introduced herself, and then introduced the program and said, hey, we're going live, call me if you need me. And within the first week, this is one of our experiences. So this is a little bit different uh, than when it was set up. It's just a... Sorry, you can go ahead while Anne comes up. So one thing, that, again, that really made this pilot a success early on is the fact that we really engaged four stakeholders in every interaction, every time. And those stakeholders are the resident and family, the physician, the nurse, the community paramedic, always together every time, making the decisions. And with I'm that, any of the stakeholders this, this at past week, oh. my husband had a medical concern at uh, Luther Care Home, and uh, we were able to have the uh, expertise of uh, paramedic come out and assess him quickly. Uh, she arrived with a marvelous number of equipment pieces in a nice, tidy bag. Uh, she was able to assess uh, his situation with uh, um, a blood work test that was coming back from the day before. And uh, she was able to equip him with an IV drip, which uh, made it possible for him to move from going to the dining room at breakfast in a wheelchair to 
uh, walking to the dining room at supper on his own with his walker. Uh, the whole experience was, uh, was excellent. As you can see, this was a huge success story really early on. And again, one of the successes is that the, the four stakeholders were part of every decision. And at any time, any of the four stakeholders can, can, can stop the line and say, hey, you know what, this isn't working for me, I really choose not to, can we not go ahead with this process of involving a community paramedic? So everyone's voice is heard, everyone's opinion really matters. And with that very collaborative, very respectful approach, and it's worked really well. So early on, senior leadership at Saskatoon Health Region really liked what was going on and they wanted to, us to expand, and they wanted us to extend pretty darn quickly. So again, we needed to choose two additional homes to add to the pilot, and they were again chosen based on the criteria that I mentioned earlier. So we met with Sherbrooke and Central Haven, and we met with their leadership, we met with their nurses, and a bit of a smaller group and then we brought that huge piece of paper that we developed with the initial homes and we showed it to them and said, hey, does this process resonate with you? Is there anything missing? And, and we were pleasantly surprised to learn that for the most part, a little bit of tweaking was required, but really the process resonated with those two new homes. And they really thought it, it really validated everything that we had done before. So we went over the materials as well, and we had to tweak, and Erica and we were typing away and doing different things so that every tool that was developed would be right for those homes. We arranged for the community paramedics to rotate through to come say hello, introduce themselves, so the staff and the residents became familiar with the faces of the community paramedics. And a go-live date was chosen. So on June 10th, the program was expanded to Sherbrooke and Central Haven. And that was such a success early on that we were asked to expand again. So on July 16th, the program moved into Oliver Lodge. And they told two friends, and they told two friends, and they told two friends. And a year later, uh, we have now expanded to all the long-term care homes in Saskatoon, except for one, and that is by their choice. So now the long-term care community paramedicine pilot is in 13 long-term care homes and it uh, provides service to almost 1,500 residents. So any pilot project has its challenges and its successes. So early on, um, probably one of the larger challenges was actually buy-in from nurses. We're a really, really tough bunch and we have been known to eat our own, so this was no different. Um, they weren't exactly sure how the community paramedics would function as part of their team. Up until that point, their experience with advanced care paramedics was, well, we would call you when we really need you to come, you know, transport a resident to hospital. And when you come through our doors, we hand the care over to you, and then you do what you need to do when you remove the resident to the hospital like we've asked you to do. And that's kind of the relationship that had always taken place up until then. Well now, we're inviting you into our home as a team player, but we've never been a team player with you before. So nurses were a little skeptical as to who would do what, who would be responsible, who would do the charting, who would do the reporting, and actually who was in control. We're control freaks. So that was one of the challenges. Um, the hours was certainly another challenge. Well, if anyone here has ever worked or been in long-term care, uh, everything doesn't happen neatly between 6.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening. So there were some calls of people really, really wanting this to, the hours to be expanded really quickly. And we're still working on that part. Another challenge was misunderstanding over what the scope of the community paramedics really was. So of course in the first week, literally, they were called upon to provide phlebotomy services as well as x-ray services. And unfortunately, the homes had to be told, sorry, we're, we don't do that stuff uh, yet, quick yet, because pretty quickly on, uh, phlebotomy did become part of their scope of practice, and the homes are ecstatic that now they can call the community paramedics for stat blood work. It's worked really well. But there were also some really, really early successes as well. And word really spread amongst the homes, and Marion's story went on, you know, onto the uh, Saskatoon Health Region website, and people started talking. 
The leaders of the homes meet every month and they talk about what the great things are going on in their home and this was front and centre. So homes became fairly excited you know, about joining the pilot as the year progressed. Another huge success was the, sh the people that were chosen or that signed up for the community paramedic uh, pilot. They're all exceptional individuals. They have a great spirit amongst them. They're real team players. They love to collaborate and are very respectful. Really great, great people that we were able to work with. Another real success was that the community paramedics, part of their standard work is to return the next day and uh, just check up on the residents that they were providing service or part of the team the day before, just to make sure that the intervention really was successful. And this has really promoted trust with the residents, families, and staff that the paramedics don't just parachute in and parachute out, but they're there to follow up to make sure that what they participated in really was a success. Another success was the standard work documents that we were developing, that we changed them the moment we heard something wasn't working, that there was a glitch, we changed them immediately and homes really got to trust the process, that we were listening and we wanted the process to work. And finally, our final success I would say is that we really do value the four stakeholders. Everyone's voice is really important and everyone has power to change the situation if they choose. So it's really been very respectful and very collaborative. Thank you, Anita. So we're very privileged to have Pat here. Pat is one of the four personal care homes that's included in this pilot. And she has been a voice for the community paramedicine program and an advocate and a champion. So thank you so much for joining us, Pat. And uh, we'll let you take it away. OK, is mine working? Yeah? OK. Um, I was just asked to talk a little bit about how the program impacted our, our facility. And um, I thought I would just uh, divide it into four sections. And the first thing is, how does it impact the resident? Um, our residents, uh, obviously, they're all elderly. There's transitional things that have happened in their lives. And they've also got medical issues that they're having to learn how to live with. And so we have a lot of fear. We have a lot of questions about what value is my life uh, now that I'm living in a personal care home and um, I don't do the things that I used to do. So when we um, started the program, uh, one of the things that I wanted to change in our home is uh, the, the fact that every time there's something small going on or a, a change in the medical condition that these folks don't always have to go to hospital. Um, and so with these folks coming in, uh, what we saw was um, that they were very respectful of the residents. Um, they really got it. They got down to the residents' level and they were able to ask them in, for their opinion about what their health problem is at that time. And one of the things with the elderly is they have the right to express their own opinion and what it is that they're seeing within their own health. And these folks have certainly been very respectful of that. It gives the residents confidence that actually the community doesn't care about them and um, that when these folks come in, they know that they're in hands of very confident uh, folks and, and it makes them feel really good about it. Um, the families, um, they're very pleased that they um, don't have to, their family doesn't have to go to hospital. None of them want to go to hospital. They all want to stay at our facility. And one of the things that we do um, work with the families and the residents in order uh, for the, them not to have to move again, we do lots of uh, care planning and all the rest of it to make sure that they don't have to leave. Um, and in one situation, we had a family who was at end of life uh, care and um, the family was with the residents. Uh, we had spent a lot of time with them. And all of a sudden, an ambulance was called from the, that suite. And so I went running up and actually, uh, the folks were already there the, and the advanced paramedic was there. And I sat with the family and I said, what is it that you think you're going to get at hospital for your mother at this point uh, that we're not doing here? And what they were frightened of is that actually her res respirations had changed because that's what happens uh, when you get to that point uh, in your journey. And uh, these folks were outside and they really helped me explain to the family uh, that in actual fact this was quite a normal process and that they could, um, their parent could stay with us uh, and she did until she passed away. So. That alone uh, in our building uh, really built up uh, the confidence that we had with them supporting and becoming part of our team. Our staff, we're out there on an island sometimes. We are a, a private uh, facility. We don't have a lot of support systems. 
and uh, we have some very young nurses in there. And when these guys come in with their confidence and uh, the way that they uh, teach our staff, it's such a bonus because our staff are building confidence in some of their assessment skills and some of their um, decision making uh, regarding the care of the elderly. And it's, it's been a real big help to our, to our staff and we've quite enjoyed having them there. And how has it helped out in the community? We have a very good reputation in the community. People know that uh, we're there to help these residents. We want to reduce the uh, trips to the hospital. And um, these folks have certainly helped us achieve that goal. And we have seen a significant decrease in the number of residents from our facility going to the hospital. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have these folks uh, as part of our team and part of our decision making. Thank you, Pat. Mm -hmm. Farron? Farron thought we were going to take so much time he wouldn't get time to talk, so the stage is yours for the next... Well, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know, I have much to say. They pretty much covered everything I was going to touch on. Um, overall, the program has really taken off and it's been a real team effort. It's been a real team response. Uh, I know Elise, who's sitting in the back of the room there, she's on the team as well. She's been hounding the directors for quite some time as to when are we going to get a community paramedic program. Come on, let's get going. We're behind the eight ball here. So when it was suggested, or not suggested, when it was announced that our community paramedic program was going to launch in long-term care, um, she jumped all over that and a number of others of us did as well because we see that's where EMS is heading towards. And the opportunity to launch our program with long-term care was that launching point. Um, the team dynamic, I would say, is next to none. Uh, we are constantly informing one another of our clients, of our residents. There's those ones where, you know, when we first go in, it's like, okay, this one we're gonna have to watch closely over time. And there's a constant update and we're going in and we're visiting, we're talking with the resident, we're talking with their family, we're talking with the care staff, and we're just, uh, it's just constant monitoring. And it's been a fantastic team effort. Um, again, the success of the program, I can actually think of two, two cases that really allowed us to progress as quickly as we did. The first one was where Anita talked about where that gentleman was sick and just with a little bit of fluid and monitoring by day's end he was back to his normal self. The second one was at the other partner site where it was a lady who was terminal cancer, bone cancer and you know she would roll over in bed and, and break a bone and I believe she actually had a fall out of bed and ended up fracturing her femur but she was very quite adamant that she was not going in and uh, so Bob was the uh, attendant that day went in and he formulated a plan with the care staff and with the resident. And um, as a result, he actually went out of his way. He's talked to orthopedics. He got some guidelines and went out, got a Zimmer splint, splinted that lady. And then unfortunately, about four days later, she passed away. But we don't view that as a fail. We actually view that as a win because she was able to stay at home and slip away in her familiar environment instead of that of the chaos that she would have experienced of being transported to an emergency department. So um, those two events I think spread word rather quickly because the staff at these care homes actually work at multiple care homes. So when they see these events they talk to the other staff members at the other sites. So when we went into the other sites I think the buy-in was higher versus the first two sites and actually uh, it's one of the biggest uh, voices against us going into one of the homes, um, she is now one of our biggest advocates of the program. So that alone was a big win as well. Um, in our short 13 months, as Anita said, we have expanded to 13 long-term care sites, four personal care homes, and three of those are actually uh, independent senior towers that have nursing availability within them and just those alone we're covering 1,895 beds. Um, on top of that we formed a partnership with Palliative Care 
where we can go, where we've been asked to go in and provide fluid resuscitation, some pain control, nausea, vomiting to those individuals as well without having to send them off to the emergency department. We formed a partnership with a, um, a group home company that deals with mental and physical disabilities. And that group home has 13 sites ranging from four beds to 20 bed sites. And we have recently started talks with forming a partnership with the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency and providing in-home services to their clientele. Because uh, as we all know, the last place you want a chemo patient is in the cesspool of an emergency department. Um, so it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, our expanded scope of services has been great, you know, being able to provide phlebotomy. Um, the care staff are just ecstatic about that. And as of the beginning of May, we've been able to go ahead and provide first dose antibiotics outside of acute care. And uh, I think there's a lot of people all over doing backflips for that service as well. Um, we've been approached by all levels. All our stakeholders have been happy that they have, now have the option of not having to go into the hospital, that they can receive services within their home. And we've actually received a lot of interest from other practitioners in our service as to, okay, when are you guys going to expand? When, when can we get in on this? Because they see the difference that we're making within the community itself. Has it made an impact on the eMERGE departments? <laughs> I think it depends on your point of view. Um, but it, overall, in the community, it definitely has. Now, the nice thing is, is that now that we've well established in long-term care, now our next launching point is going to be into the community. So hopefully, once we form an agreement with this um, cancer agency, that'll be our launch point to the community and we'll just snowball from there. And that's my experience. Thank you, Farron. Um, we, Gary, I know that we're, most of this panel <coughs> is leaving and they won't, <coughs> pardon me, they won't be available on breaks. So I'm wondering if anybody, if we want to take a minute just to ask them questions, if you have any, because otherwise they, they will be gone. Well, hearing, hearing about other programs, you know, they're doing, going out and they're working with those individuals. Um, you know, I'll use a diabetic as, as an example. So going out and working with, with those clients, maintaining, ensuring that, you know, they're monitoring their sugars, that they're looking after their, their insulin control, um, even their diet. So, you know, we'd, we'd have to form other partnerships with dietary services and home care and and just again working with those individuals where from a transport point of view when we go when they call us because of their situation where we go in and it's like man I wish we didn't have to take you in you know is there something that we could do for you here and now so working with those individuals I think also fair and ad hocly we uh, we tried to identify a couple of our super users early on and uh, to, make the, to make the program financially viable, I think the region looks at, at an average of three calls per day or, or some in that neighborhood where we, where we create three ER avoidances per day. And uh, selfishly, as, as, a, as an entity, MD Ambulance was looking at some of our super users, identifying that, that we had one gentleman who was calling us, as I'm sure many of you can identify with, not only numerous times per week, but sometimes numerous times per day. And uh, we were having the, the community paramedic go out and, and visit that person's residence routinely at a specific set time where we identified that typically his, his calls come within that, that window of time and do a drop by on our timeline as opposed to him calling us on our timeline, on his timeline rather, when we're inundated with calls and offload delays. So we would try and uh, you know, allow him to have that impact and, and uh, very low needs as far as uh, ER assessments or or definitive care that was being done, but he always wanted to go in, he always wanted to be transported, and then typically left without, uh, without any interventional care. So I think that's yet a, a vessel that, that we'll pursue further.
That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel.